Today, we're talking about Texas A&M and the $75 million man. All that next on Armchair Sports Talk. Welcome back. My name is Sean Hicks. Let's go ahead and jump right into the Texas A&M preview. So, first of all, I need to get my biases up front. I try to do that in every preview and every video, and I dislike Jimbo Fisher. I think he ran a trash program at Florida State. Felt he was really dirty. The culture was terrible. It was a lot more than just the James Winston say, thing. I was in college when he was um, at UGA while he was at Florida State. I had a lot of friends that went there. There was a lot of really well-known things that were really out in the open between him and his police and the program that was going on. There's a reason why on Last Chance U that you had three straight Florida State quarterbacks jump in. I'm not going to focus on that too much, but I think it's worth you guys knowing my biases as I go in and have this conversation. When I look at Jimbo Fisher, to me, he is Barry Switzer in a lot of ways, in that there's no doubt that he has some trouble in the off the field stuff. Look at how Switzer left Oklahoma before he went to the Cowboys, if you don't know. But man, he's undoubtedly a great football coach. I don't know if he's a 75 guarantee million dollar contract level football coach. The truth is, his first season at Texas A&M was a massive success. Got in the top 15 in SP really turned around a lot of parts of the program. Kellen Mond took a huge step forward, and it was just a huge boon to the entire fan base. But here's a problem that you have when you're Texas A&M, is you have to realize that you are not going to be Alabama, Georgia this year. You have to realize that despite recruiting very well, it's going to take you some time to really be a true national championship contender, even if Jimbo Fisher is everything that they say he is. Me living in Texas, knowing a lot of Texas A&M fans, I can tell you they're going to be really disappointed because if he can go 8-4, this is going to be a great year for Texas A&M. And that's your goal, guys. 8-4, that's what you want to be. That's what happens when you have to go play Georgia. That's what happens when you have to play Alabama and you have to play the rest of the SEC West. So just keep that in mind when you're thinking about how great you're going to be. 8-4 is an awesome team. 9-3 might be a legendary team and a legendary coaching job. Keep that in mind. So let's start with the most important position. And the one thing that you have is Kellen Mond. And Kellen Mond is a baller. He is going to be awesome this year. He was great last year. He took a huge step forward from his freshman year to his sophomore year. And in the same way, when I was talking about Felipe Franks, when during his first year under Mullen, you have reason to expect that he are going to have even a better year in your third year, on, or in your second year under Jimbo Fisher, your third year starting. I, I really think when you look at Mond, he had some great moments last year. A lot of it was either great play design or outside the pocket and making plays happen. Needs to get a lot more consistent inside the pocket, letting plays develop, going through his progressions. I think he'll have a good chance to do that that year. Again, last year was his first year under Jimbo's offense, and he's had a history of getting his quarterbacks to really progress. Um, I think the potential to be a real top guy is going to be is able to be unlocked here. Potential to leave early and be a high draft pick is on the table. I'm not 100% sure he will get there just because of how difficult the SEC West is and Tua is going to have it locked up. But to me, he's an all-SEC type performer, even if he doesn't get mentioned in that because Jacob Brantley might get thrown in and get the legacy for all, um, all-SEC team when I think Fromm and Tua pretty much have one and two wrapped up. Um, he's got to stay healthy is a big component of this. I'll bring this up when we get to the LL section. Made a lot of the sacks – that I felt they had it was kind of to his fault of being able to try to scramble around and make a play happen. Their sack rate was pretty high last year. I don't think it was an OL fault. I think it was Mon uh, just scrambling and not sticking with his progressions, getting rid of the ball. If he can stay healthy, doesn't have the dip that he had um, last year when he started um, getting hurt, looking for a massive year from him. Um, I, I really think this offense has really top-level potential, I, as, you, as you'll see. I really like it a lot. Let's talk about the people he's throwing the ball to. You know, it, my question that I have here is, do they have someone who can stretch the field? They've got a lot of really big dudes, big bodies. I don't know if they have a true field stretch. Love a lot of the slot guys they have, but neither none of them are like home run type guys, right? Christian Kirk isn't on this roster when you take a look at someone who can just be a true game breaker. I know they're really hoping for Kendrick Davis to do it. He's got a lot of speed. He hasn't quite been the true deep ball threat. Got a couple last last year, 
He's got to make the leap forward. Can definitely happen given his age from a receiver progressing to a junior. A lot of reasons to think he can be good. I, just watching him, I don't know if he's truly that guy that they need to be the truth. Christian, there's not going to be a lot around him. Listen, guys, I, I'm, I'm a big fan. I love Austin like anybody else. The dude's huge. He's basically a tight end playing receiver. He's going to catch some post routes on him. He's going to body guys for jump balls. But I don't think even given the size, he's a true down-the-field home run threat jump ball guy. Maybe 20-yard type level, but it's just not the true downfield threat that they need to they need to really have from a game-breaking standpoint. Again, nitpick here really, guys. Um, really good on that. And I think the strength of the team is funny. It is, might come from the offensive line. So what definitely has to be one of the best coaching jobs of last year, Jim Turner, turning around an offensive line that had a lot of returning starters, a lot of young guys, but that really struggled two years ago to make anything happen. You can tell what a cohesive unit was able to be able to do another year of development. They got really damn good at running the football. I've already said the sack rate I don't think is really on them. And, man, they have 54 returning starts, between, and they have four returning starters on this offensive line. I'm thinking it's probably going to be right up there with Georgia for the best in the conference. Uh, it, it, it's good. Not maybe the depth of maybe an Alabama or Georgia has, but starting five, I mean, it's going to be right up there, right? Um, their line yards last year was in the top ten. I mean, they were getting a lot of push as they move forward. You got to hope one of their running backs, whether that's going to be Jay Sean Corbin or really one of their many question marks that they have. Lots of bullets in the chamber. Think it'll be good, but they're going to be starting from a great spot because I think they're going to be delivering people two, three yards down the line of scrimmage for them to be able to start. It, it you don't have to be as good as a running back if you're just getting that type of movement, and that's what you expect to see. Um, they do need to prove in pass protection. I think they were around the fifties last year. Need to get better, no question. Like I said, I think they will, given the extra year starting, the second year in the offense, and Mon getting more comfortable in the pocket. Good reason to expect that they're going to be more improved in this. Probably their secrets are going to be higher with Mon, but if they get in the 20s, I think what you're looking at is a truly dominant line. And this offense is going to score, man. It's going to score a lot of points. It's going to score them fast. They're going to be relatively explosive. But more than that, they're going to be as efficient as hell and possible, impossible to stop. I bet you their efficiency mark trick on both the offense uh, passing game and the running game is probably going to be in the top 15, even with the defenses they're going against. No question. Now, if I talk so much about how I love the offense and I don't think they're going to be the Alabama, Georgia, true dark horse contender here, there's got to be a reason why I don't think that. And it comes down to the defense, really. Now, I really am a big fan of Chavis, their defensive coordinator. I think he's really good, knows what he's doing, but they lose a lot of talent, specifically on the front seven. From their defensive line, I think they can replace it, but Justin, um, and I'm going to mispronounce this, say Maduki has to be more than an all-SEC guy. He's got to be an all-American type level performer. Can do it. Eight tackles for loss. I think he had like eight sacks and eight and a half tackles for loss, which is a little weird. By the way, only having 0.5 tackles for loss is not a sack. But, I, I mean, certainly that screams can be a huge stud. Uh, Michael Clemens has a lot of chance to be a breakout candidate. Uh, had a really good, strong sophomore season. Really athletic, highly ranked. Um, I like Tyree Johnson on the edge. think he might be more a specialist pass rusher. Not sure he can uh, consistently hold up. But there's serious uh, question at the defensive tackle and the nose tackle spot specifically. You're relying on a true sophomore to be able to take over. You've got a redshirt freshman behind him. <laughs> That's not what you want to see. That takes some seasoning of a position. You know, if they can be okay, I think that's what you're looking for there. Um, and I think that's really going to hurt what you have as an option. Probably going to see a lot of um, okay gains when it comes to the defensive line. But I think can really get after the quarterback. Has a good enough chance to reload. Um, from a linebacker standpoint, hey, man, Buddy Johnson's going to be real good. And he, he needs to be real good because there's no experience at the end of their spot. Talent, sure. Talent. But young, very young. Uh, didn't play as much last year as you're probably hoping for a team that had a lot of young guys and need a lot of seasoning. I mean, the tackle rates are guys are really low. I think besides Johnson, I think 20 is about the most you have coming back from that. Um, 
talent, but I think you can expect some missed blitz pickups and some missed uh, gap fills. What that usually means is pretty damn explosive at times. You combine that with a defensive line that I don't know consistently dominate the line of scrimmage on a running game standpoint, makes me question whether they can be consistently good against the run. Think that they might say against, oh, I don't know, Georgia, get planted back too often where Georgia can just run it down their throat, where maybe Mississippi State, um, where you get to the really good teams that you just don't have enough to be able to stop them. Um, secondary, you know, if you had a, a really great secondary and you had a really strong D-line and maybe some questions at linebackers, I think you could still plug that in and turn that to a real top defense. Listen, man, Miles Joe and, uh, Jones and Aaron Burrow have to be okay. That they have to be because there is nobody behind those guys. I mean, okay, sure they exist, but a senior that can barely get on a field, a freshman that's too tiny. I mean, that's listen behind them. That's 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 not good. Um, they need Miles Jones and Renfro to be healthy, and hopefully that they can survive when P teams go three, four wide against them. I mean, that that's what that's what they have to be. The safeties really weren't that good last year. They're relying on a true sophomore to turn into a junior who was bad last year. He was bad, and now you're hoping he can take a, a leap. I, it doesn't normally work that way. If you saw a bunch of progression, then we could see it, but it, this just looks like big play fiesta in the backfield. Um, so you have a defense that can probably get a lot of tackles for loss and a pretty good havoc rate, but I don't know if consistently can stall drives and can't consistently stop big plays from happening. Uh, it's not going to be bad. Again, Chavis is good. If they can get to the top 25, I think you're cooking something here, right? Maybe a, a chance to upset one of the big guys. Don't know if they're going to be able to do it. Um, to me, this seems like a top 15 team that's going to be 7-5, and 8-4. Texas A&M fans are going to be pissed at that because, listen, perspective is hard to tell when you lose four games. But listen, 8-4 and four is a great damn season for you guys. 9-3, and three, um, go, that, then you guys are truly amazing. Um, Offense, again, top potential. It's going to be good no matter what. Has the ability to be amazing. Um, defense, I think, can be good. I don't know if it can be very good. Um, they're thin. they got to hope they stay healthy a lot. And, man, that schedule, it's not a whole lot of fun when you have to do the entire SEC West and go to Georgia as your cross game. Man, get out of here. It's going to, it's going to be tough. Um, my mind, end of the day, you're looking at a – top team that doesn't look like that from a record wise all right guys let me know what you think by dropping some comments below uh, don't forget to subscribe to this video subscribe to super uh, to future episodes also share this with a friend check out our merch show show us some love from armchair sports we'll see you next time